Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Hashtag Ask GSM, the weekly Monday Mailbag video where we answer your questions from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter right here in this video forum. Coming off of a very controversial 24 hours in the wrestling world, um, I will be touching upon TNA losing their TV deal with Spike TV a little later on in the video towards the end, so make sure to stay tuned for that. But also it was announced today by WWE that they had signed Prince Devitt. Um, I haven't seen much of his work, but from what I've heard, he's extremely talented, so it's a great acquisition for the WWE. Um, I didn't get any questions on that because, like I said, it happened this morning. All the questions that were asked from people from Facebook and Twitter were from last night, so this is before the, any of that occurred. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to give my two cents on that. I will be going more in-depth on it on this week's WrestleRant Radio. So, chief plug there. Make sure you check it out tomorrow, Tuesday, next year, wrestling.weebly.com. But without further ado... Let's get to this week's questions. A lot of great ones this week. We'll start from with Jose C. from YouTube. He's got two questions. His first one was, Have you noticed that Bray Wyatt is kind of portrayed as the Joker from Batman? Even in his match with John Cena, he was trying to bring out the dark side of Cena, just like Joker and Batman. He laughs when he gets hit. I see him as the next mankind, but as a heel. Um, great observation. A lot of people, myself included, were saying that during the Bray Wyatt and John Cena feud, um, Bray Wyatt was channeling his inner Joker. Even a lot of the lines that they used in their promos, not more so Bray, but definitely John Cena. Even on his Twitter, he uh, he posted uh, a line from Batman: The Dark Knight the other day, saying that uh, you can't live a hero forever. If you if you live you, if you live long enough, you either see yourself die a hero or live long enough to become a villain or something along those lines. John Cena tweeted that out the other day, but he did use a lot of those lines, similar similar lines that were used in The Dark Knight. And then other Batman movies um, during his feud with Bray Wyatt a few months ago. So I definitely see that comparison. But it's funny that you mentioned that for one reason. Oh, for two reasons, actually. One being that I'm wearing my Ultimate Warrior Batman t-shirt that I just got in the mail yesterday, which is pretty sweet. Um, limited edition, only 50 were made. Hashtag always believe. But um, anyway, though, the second funny reason why you mentioned that is because Dean Ambrose is seen as kind of like WWE's version of the Joker. People that aren't even fans of wrestling can see Dean Ambrose and the similarities between him and and the Joker character just based off his mannerisms, his mic skills, the craziness in his persona. And that's what makes Dean Ambrose one of my favorite wrestlers. That's also another question that comes later on in the video. But yeah, Dean Ambrose is excellent in his role. I see him more of the Joker than Bray Wyatt. Uh, Jose's second question was, what is the next for Triple H and Randy Orton? They have kind of been slowly getting out of the main event scene and letting Rollins and Reigns and Cena do their thing. Triple H isn't even an active wrestler. I know he was in the main event of Payback, and he faced Daniel Bryan, and that was the main event storyline of WrestleMania. He still kind of is involved in the main event scene, if you think about it. I mean, he's the authority, and the authority has been in the main event scene since the start of the angle a year ago. So it's not like he's competing for championships, but then again, he hasn't been competing for titles for, what, four or five years now? Um, he's been a part-timer, so to speak. I mean, he's always on TV. But he just doesn't wrestle all that often, which is probably for the best because it feels more special when he eventually does compete on that occasional basis. Um, as it goes for Randy Orton, Randy Orton, I wouldn't say is in like the mid card. I would probably say the upper mid card right now, um, which is probably for the best. I mean, I didn't really enjoy his WWE World WWE title run. I've seen far worse title runs, but that one specifically, um, he was. It, it wasn't Randy Orton's fault. I love him better as a heel. I can't even tell you how mark how much I marked out. When Randy Orton went heel last year at SummerSlam with Triple H, that whole angle when Daniel Bryan uh, lost the title in five seconds, Orton cashed in, heel authority. I thought that was the most amazing thing ever, but they botched the follow-up, they botched the aftermath, and it ended up becoming an absolute joke. And it wasn't Randy Orton's fault, like I said before. I mean, he might have been a little less motivated than usual during his heel shtick earlier this year. I mean, he wasn't being booked the best way. He was losing, not, he was losing non-title Matches left and right to guys like Cesaro, Seamus, Daniel Bryan, even a goddamn Kofi Kingston clean in an episode of Raw, if you can recall that. So it's not Orton's fault. And uh, like I said before, I'm not, I, I'm particularly, I, I am a little bit happy about him not being involved in the title picture right now. Um, just let guys like Lesnar and Cena do their thing. And I got a little, I got a couple of questions about Brock Lesnar, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But um, as it goes for Randy Orton, I think it's better for him not to be involved in the main event right now. I'm not saying he'll never be world champion again because I can 99% guarantee you that he will be champion at some point again. Maybe not anytime soon, but he will be at some point. I can definitely guarantee you that. Um, but that being said, I think it's great for Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, like you said before, Dean Ambrose, 
All these guys are getting over in amazing fashion. It's very, very rare that you have a stable breakup consisting of more than two people, and all of them are in, a, are in a better place than they were beforehand. Rollins is over. Reigns is crazy over, as is Dean Ambrose. Arguably the second and third top baby faces in the company right now with Daniel Bryan out, CM Punk gone, and John Cena being number one. And he probably will be number one for years to come. But that's great, and you can also throw in the names like Bray Wyatt in there as well, who's another guy who's not competing for the championship. I'm not saying he should be, but he's another guy that's in the top upper mid-card level right now, slowly going into main event with feuds with guys like John Cena, which didn't pan out too well, but he did feud with the face of the company, as well as Chris Jericho right now. So yeah, I think it's great. Jared J., his question, and now we're getting to the Facebook questions here, his question was, do you think WWE should consider signing stars like AJ Styles, Steve Carino, or Christopher Daniels to short runs so they can end their careers in WWE like they did for Goldberg or Sting? Good question. I was thinking the same, something similar, not that exact theory, um, with guys like AJ Styles. I mean, you sign someone like a like a Sting, and the buzz behind sing, signing to WWE has been huge. The guy got a great reaction when that commercial aired for WWE 2K15 a few weeks ago on Raw. That was awesome. Sent chills down my spine. Very well put together a commercial for Sting um, in his debut in the WWE video game franchise. As well as him at Comic-Con a couple of days ago, I think in San Diego, he came out to do a panel with Hogan and Daniel Bryan and a few others, and um, it was a big pop for Sting. It was really, really cool to see him amongst those WWE top-level stars um, in Legends, of course, including Hulk Hogan, <laughs> which is funny because you think back not even a year ago, we're Sting and Hulk Hogan involved in like the main event-level storylines in TNA, both Sting and Hulk Hogan a year later, they're back together in WWE, along with Ric Flair. Ric Flair, Hogan, and Sting were probably the centerpieces, the focal points of TNA no more than a few years ago. Now they're all back in WWE or Sting in WWE because he's never technically been there. But I just found that funny. But uh, to go back to your question with AJ Styles, here's the difference between Goldberg, Sting, and then those guys that you mentioned, specifically guys like Carino and Daniels. And, and Salas, for that matter. All of those guys are extremely talented. I, for one, being a major fan of AJ Styles, who's my favorite wrestler in TNA, now that he's gone, he's, it's no longer the case. And I started watching Ring of Honor for guys like Daniels and AJ Styles, hearing that they were going over. And Steve Carino is great as well, from what I've seen and you know, from, heard from him on commentary and whatnot, and ROH in the short time I've been watching it. But the difference between those three guys that you mentioned and Goldberg and Sting is the fact that Goldberg and Sting were draws. Sting, maybe not as big of a draw as many other people, but the thing with Sting is that he's never competed in WWE. There's such a major buzz, and there has been for years, about Sting going to WWE. AJ Styles has never been publicly acknowledged by WWE. Sting has, time and time again. You go back to their polls, the website, the YouTube videos. They mention Sting at every possible chance they get, even when he was in TNA for years upon years upon years. So, with that being said, WWE fans... When they eventually do see Sting, and I can, I'm can, i guaranteeing you of this, when they eventually do see Sting appear up on WWE TV, pop him, ha having him pop up on Raw, SmackDown, whatever, uh, probably Raw or Pay-Per-View, um, it's going to be a big, major moment. Because fans, casual fans, can see that this guy's never been in the company before. This is a mark-out moment. This is a milestone moment that we are watching right here, right now. This is huge. With AJ Styles, the only other time I can... Honestly, remember him being mentioned by WWE, never on TV, of course, but um, in that video on the YouTube channel a few weeks ago, which I thought was a pretty nice nod to him with the five wrestlers that you never knew competed in WWE, and AJ Styles, I guess, competed on a few um, jacked tapings in the early 2000s when he was still under contract with WCW. With that being said, though, um, it, it, they're just... I, I'm not saying that there wouldn't be a pop for AJ Styles if he were to come in, especially in like a post-WrestleMania Raw, like if you were to come in in front of the smarky crowds like in Chicago or New York or Canada even or England or whatever, they'd pop big because they know who AJ Styles is. The casual crowds, probably not, especially more so for a guy like Steve Carino or Christopher Daniels. And um, I would fear that if they were to bring in a Carino or Daniels, they would repackage them. And not only that, but they're older too, so it's not like Goldberg and Sting, it's one match and they're done. But they're such big names that it's okay for them to do that. AJ Styles, you can say whatever you want about the guy. He's a great talent, one of the best ever to not compete for a WWE as a contracted talent. Um, and, and obviously the face of TNA for many, many, many years. 
But the guy, being 39 years old, he's not one of those guys, or however old he is, he's not one on like the part-time level of guys like Sting, guys like The Rock, Brock Lesnar, Batista even. He's not even that well-known amongst WWE fans to the point where he can score a deal like that for a one match and you're done. Sting is scoring one of those match deals because he's 50 freaking five years old or something like that. And he can only do one more match. AJ Styles is wrestling week every week every week on the indies and in ROH, and he can still go. But if they were going to bring in AJ Styles, he would be a regular part of the roster. And just being as old as he is, I just don't see that being a possibility. I know Kenta and maybe even Prince Devon, I'm not exactly sure, are in their 30s. But AJ Styles is in his later 30s. And he doesn't – I'm not saying he doesn't have much time left as an active wrestler, but I just not at all can't see them bringing them in. If they didn't bother to contact him when he left from TNA – I'm um, the biggest name that TNA had to offer aside from Angle, Sting, and Hardy. Then I can't see him coming to WWE, unfortunately, especially for guys like Daniels. We did hear a rumor about a couple years ago that tried to go to WWE after he was fired from TNA, I think in 2010, and they didn't want him because he was too old, maybe. Which is a shame because Christopher Daniels, in my opinion, is the greatest TNA star to never win a world championship. So that was, those are my thoughts on that. Great question, though. Thomas B., his question was. How do you think WWE will book Brock Lesnar as champion since he probably won't be on every week? And who do you think will be in the title picture in the later part of 2014? So this is the ever-popular question, what happens with Brock Lesnar? Okay, so with Brock Lesnar, there was no real way that they could bring him back. And they had to bring him back for SummerSlam. They did in 2012. They did in 2013. He's been gone since the night after WrestleMania. He didn't work Extreme Rules. He didn't work Payback, Money in the Bank, whatever. He needs to work SummerSlam. Because he hasn't worked many dates at all since WrestleMania. He hasn't worked anything at all since the day after WrestleMania. So with that being said, though, um, they needed to have him work SummerSlam. And it wouldn't, have made, it wouldn't have made any sense for him to come back and face anyone else except the champion. He, I mean, I would love the match against seeing a non-title or against Sheamus even, but he doesn't even mean much right now, so it might not have mattered. But um, I would have loved a regular matchup with Brock Lesnar. But the thing is, it's not possible. This guy just ended the freaking undefeated streak of The Undertaker at WrestleMania 21-1 and at WrestleMania due to Brock Lesnar. There is no way this guy could come back and not compete for the championship, especially considering that Brock Lesnar, long before he even conquered the streak at WrestleMania, was advocating for a championship matchup. You go back to the final Raw of 2013, people. He was saying that he deserves to be champion. He wants to be champion. He had to go through the Big Show and The Undertaker to do it. But he deserved to be champion. And now on Raw this week, they confirmed, or last week I should say, they confirmed that will be John Cena, Brock Lesnar 2 at SummerSlam for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So that being said, there's one issue. They had to have him come back for SummerSlam, and they couldn't have had any, him, have him do anything else except for go for the championship because it would have made sense. Two is the fact that now that he's in the championship match, he can't lose. Brock Lesnar, after losing to The Undertaker, after beating The Undertaker at WrestleMania, is in a whole new level of superstardom. I mean, this guy was a draw before. He was a marquee name before. But now beating The Undertaker's streak, he has a major head of momentum going into SummerSlam, a major wave of momentum. So they can't ruin that by having him lose. The internet would explode if Brock Lesnar lost to John Cena, of all people, at SummerSlam and failed to win the championship. So by this point, they need to have him win the title. But he's not going to be on Raw every week. I hate people that are saying, oh, he'll sign more dates. He's Brock fucking Lesnar. The guy's not going to sign more dates. The guy does not like wrestling. I love Brock Lesnar. I love the guy to death. But the guy doesn't love wrestling. Why should he be coming to work? The guy get paid. The guy gets paid $5 million a, a year as it is, okay? So let's just say that real quick. So he gets paid that much for what it's worth right now. And he's only working, what, 10 days a year out of 365? Why would he sign on for more dates if he doesn't have to? He's got the money. He's content. He's doing as much as he needs to do. Put on a couple of great matches a year, and he's all set. You know what I mean? So it doesn't make any sense for Brock Lesnar to sign more dates on his end. And I wouldn't either if I was him. So that's not happening. Let's write that off right now. because He's already signed his deals. He's already signed his contract. He's with us, I think, until WrestleMania 31 officially, unless he signs more dates past that. But that being said, though, um, what do they do in the meantime? Because obviously they're not going to have him compete. They're probably an out of champions, I heard, because he didn't work extreme roles. So he'll probably work an out of champions for the championship. They shouldn't even have him drop the title there because the guy is so 
freaking over right now after beating The Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania, it's too soon for him to lose. The earliest that he should be losing is at WrestleMania, in my opinion, to a Roman Reigns or whoever else. Maybe not Daniel Bryan. That's not the most logical thing in the world to have Daniel Bryan beat this beast of Brock Lesnar. But um, that being said, though, the earliest that he should lose is WrestleMania. So what do you do in the meantime? I was listening to the Solid Monster Sounds Off yesterday. Great podcast. Go check it out. Someone sent him in a question saying that they should have an interim champion. So I'm not taking, I'm not laying claim to this idea at all. It was someone on his show that suggested it to him. And I thought that was a great idea. Hold an interim championship, much like the UFC does. And WWE and UFC are two very different things. And they tried to do something similar when CM Punk took the title and left. So Brock Lesnar could say that he won the championship. And they're not going to say that, oh, he's at home sitting home right now. He's not going to appear on TV. They could say that he quit and he took the championship with him. I don't care. You can do whatever you want. So they do that. And um, they crown a new interim champion in the meantime, coming on to face Brock Lesnar for the undisputed, or uh, even more undisputed than it already is, championship at WrestleMania 31. So that's probably the best scenario that they could do because I can't think of anything else they could possibly do with Brock Lesnar because I know for a fact that he won't be appearing on TV much at all following Night of Champions at the very least. So with that being said, and your sec the second part of your question was, who do you think should be in the title picture in the later part of 2014? Definitely Seth Rollins. I mean, that's an obvious one because he's the Money in the Bank winner right now. He's the Mr. Money in the Bank. Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns maybe. Um, you can have him win his first championship at WrestleMania. That's how I would book it. They are going to go that direction. Batista even. Have, Dean, have Batista come back, and he's due back for a, a return at some point. Have Batista come back. and Because um, I know he was involved in the title picture for the first part of his run earlier this year. But he never really got his rightful one-on-one -on -one match for the championship at WrestleMania. So that can be his big thing when he comes back. Whether he be feuding with Dean Ambrose or Roman Reigns even, I think that could be a good feud. Maybe not the best matches, but the two of a very interesting dynamic, especially given they were the final two in this year's Royal Rumble. So that being said, and I also see Roman Reigns as like this version, this generation's version of Batista, you know, breaking away from the Shield, stuff like that. So that being said, um, yeah, Batista, all the members of the Shield... John Cena, I really don't want to see him lose the title then gain it back, much like he did with uh, in 2011 with Punk and Money in the Bank and all that BS. Um, I thought that was a great angle, but to have him lose the title at Money in the Bank and win it back eight days later in a tournament on Raw, or he beat the champion of that tournament, the winner of that tournament, Rey Mysterio, to win back that championship, it was like going back to the status quo within a short period of time. After you see all this change go down at Money in the Bank, you go back to the same stagnant status quo at, um, only eight days removed from Money in the Bank, one of the greatest pay-per-views, in my opinion, in recent memory. So that being said, yeah, all the members of the Shield, Batista, hopefully not John Cena. Hopefully John Cena is doing something else. But what else he does, I have no idea because he has no more fresh views left. He's feuded with freaking everybody right now. So uh, that being said, yeah, the, all the members of the Shield, maybe even get throw Batista in there as well. Andre G, he's got two questions. Uh, first one was, what do you do with Curtis Axel? He is a good old school type wrestler, but he's very boring. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm a fan of Curtis Axel. Have been since his Michael McGillicuddy days. Not a big fan, but I do respect the fact that he's a great wrestler. Like you said, he's got no charisma. The thing with Paul Heyman didn't pan out very well, obviously. But what do you do with the guy? I think WWE is making the best decision right now, is doing the best booking they possibly can with him by putting him in a tag team. Where he doesn't, the spotlight's not all on him. And whoever his tag team partner is could have more personality than he does. He does the wrestling. They do the they do the uh, charisma part. And it makes for a good tag team. And, I mean, I hate saying this, but Ray Baxel does that. Um, I'm not a big fan of Ray Baxel. I never thought they had any chemistry together. They've kind of shown some chemistry in the last six months or so. But I think Ryback at this point is much better off on his own. People are starting to get back into Ryback again and to feed me more chance. I got, more, uh, I got, I got a Ryback question coming up in a little bit. So that being said, though, I think Ryback is better off on his own. What you do with Curtis Axel, I don't know. You probably should put him in another tag team. With who? I'm not really sure. David Otunga, I thought that was an even worse tag team when they were teaming back in 2011. God, was that a disaster. But, um, yeah, I think the guy's better off in a tag team than he is in a singles run because, like you said, he's boring. People can't get into him. But when he's in a tag team and he's allowed to do the wrestling, the partner does the charisma part, the personality, then it makes for a good tag team. Like I said, not a fan of Ryback Axel. But it does accomplish that to an extent. The second question was, who should, Triple H, who should Triple H's last opponent be before he retires? I can't honestly tell you. Because if you told me two, even a year ago, 
um, two years ago, even a year ago, that Triple H would be facing Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania, I would have laughed in your face. If you told me that he might be feeding with Roman Reigns of all people, I would have laughed in your face even harder. Um, so Triple H is always mixing it up with the young talent. So, And he's only 45. He turned 45 a few days ago. So I think he's got a couple more years left in him. Not as an active wrestler, of course. He hasn't been since 2010. But for the part-time matches that he does, he's in great shape. He's had great matches with The Shield, with Daniel Bryan, Brock Lesnar. Um, not the best series of matches, but they did have average to very good matches with Brock Lesnar from SummerSlam um, you know, in 2012, 2013, whatever. So that being said, I can't tell you because I think the current roster, the landscape will be changing in coming years. Someone that we don't, that's not even on the roster right now could be facing Triple H in his last matchup five years from now at WrestleMania 35. So I can't really tell you at this point in time. But um, with that in mind, though, people from the current roster, Batista said, I just read in the interview, that his he wanted his last match to be with Triple H. I don't know about that. We've seen that before, but it would be interesting, I guess, you know, going off of their WrestleMania 21 feud. Um... Bray Wyatt, I don't, I don't know, really see that. Maybe Sting, I don't know. I mean, Sting might be coming up at WrestleMania 31. That's a, that match is a possibility. They've been teasing that on uh, their YouTube channel and Triple H's interviews with Michael Cole and stuff like that. I could see that happening, but I don't see this trip. I don't see it being as Triple H's last matchup because, like I said, the guy's 45 years old. He's got at least five years left in him doing these part-time occurrences as a wrestler. So, um, yeah, that's my answer. I can't really tell you, but. There had to be someone from the current generation, um, from someone on the roster right now. Um, I can't, like I said, there's really nobody that comes to mind. Like, CM Punk would have been great, but he's gone. Maybe he comes back and a career at Triple H. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I can't really tell you, to be honest with you, which kind of sucks. But um, RJ, my buddy from Russell Rant Radio, his question was, do you think Roman Reigns could be the number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship post-SummerSlam? Absolutely. Like I said before, Brock Lesnar is probably due to stick around post-SummerSlam, going to the United Champions, seeing how he didn't work Extreme Rules. And um, But like I said to answer Thomas' question earlier on in the video, I could definitely see Roman Reigns being involved in the title picture. Maybe not immediately after SummerSlam, because I think if he faces Randy Orton at SummerSlam, he'll go on to face Triple H at Night of Champions. I think that's backwards. I think they should have done Triple H at SummerSlam, then Orton down the line. Um, that's a SummerSlam-worthy matchup, but whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, I could see Roman Reigns being involved in the title picture by year's end, along with Dean Ambrose, along with Seth Rollins. That could be a very interesting three-way for, like, a Survivor Series. That Actually, now that I think about it, that'd be amazing, okay? You have Brock Lesnar leave with the championship. You crown a new interim champion. Somehow, someway, Seth Rollins is the new champion, and then he, go out, he goes on to defend the title against Dean Ambrose, his current rival, who I think they should be feuding for a very long time that has the potential to be one of the best feuds in years. And then you throw in Roman Reigns in there as well. Triple threat match for the title at Survivor Series. Exactly two years removed from when The Shield made their debut in WWE. Hashtag book it. So I would love to see that now that I think about it. That just came up. That just came to me off the top of my head. But um, yeah, Roman Reigns would more than likely, will more than likely be involved in the title picture after SummerSlam or at the latest after Night of Champions. Next question comes from Vincent L. His question was, do you think Ryback will ever get the chance to be a top flight singles competitor in WWE again, or is he forever going to be a mid-card guy now? Um, I've gotten questions like this in the past, but I'll answer them again here. Some stuff has changed since the last time I answered this question. But um, I think it's well documented. I'm a big fan of Ryback. Always have been, going back to his Skip Sheffield days. Maybe not as Ryan Reeves back in Tough Enough, but going back to Skip Sheffield, always thought the guy got had potential. And um, I was really, really very much enjoying his run as a babyface. The whole Feed Me More things, the whole Feed Me More chant. He was crazy over in 2012, even in the early part of 2013. I thought he should have won the Royal Rumble. I thought they botched that by having Cena win again. But um, only my two cents on that. But anyway, um, we go on to a little later on in the year. The guy's not even on TV. Because the guy, I don't want to say he was buried by John Cena. For the guy, they turned him heel, and they just completely ruined any momentum that he had in uh, losing every pay-per-view match for almost a year straight. So it was kind of a joke. It really was a joke. And it's a shame because, like I said, the guy was the most over guy in the company, arguably, for a number of months in 2012 and going into 2013. I went to a live event in October of 2012. <laughs> I probably saw more Ryback shirts than I did John Cena shirts. Not even bullshitting you. There were a lot of Ryback shirts sold that night. 
on that live event that I went to in October of 2012. And that was right up and going into his Hell in a Cell match with CM Punk at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. So that being said, though, I still think there is hope. I don't, I don't want to say that I've lost all faith and lost all hope in a re-push for Ryback. I mean, being as old as he is, I can't see him being champion. But, um, you know, in, in recent weeks, for the last month or so, he's been teasing bringing back the Feed Me More chains. And he said in a WrestleMania panel earlier this year that he might be bringing back the Feed Me More chains at some point. Um, he said they weren't going to be forever gone, and he would was indeed going to bring back the chant at some point. Um, he said that in the WrestleMania panel on the WWE Network earlier this year, and it looks like that time has come. Like, I know the fans were chanting it on their own, like, organically during some of his matches recently. But even on a Superstars match, and don't ask me why I watch Superstars in the Network, but during a recent Superstars matchup, he himself went up to the top rope and started chanting, Feed Me More, getting the crowd into his recent chant. So I think if he breaks away from Axel, and I know there were rumors of that happening, I mean, take what you read on the internet with a grain of salt, but I would love to see that happen, to see him get repushed again as a singles guy, as a babyface. I think it could be great. So I don't think all hope is lost. I don't know if he can get back to that same level he was at before, but at least turn a babyface, do something meaningful with him in the mid card at the very least, if not the upper mid card, and um, try to get him back over as over as he was before. I mean, it's at least it's worth a shot. It might not be as successful this time around as it was in 2012, but like I said, it's worth a shot. Next question comes from Justin G. His question was, if you could form a six-man faction similar to the Nexus, who would you want to be a part of your faction? Three superstars from WWE and three superstars from TNA. I believe I've answered this question before. Maybe not exactly word for word, but something very similar. I think I said like a British invasion like stable. I, I stick with that with Magnus from TNA, Bram from TNA, Douglas Williams is gone, but maybe uh, Rob Terry. I mean, he's terrible, but he could be the muscle of the group. So Magnus Bram and Rob Terry from TNA from WWE, Wade Barrett, William Regal, and uh, probably Adrian Neville, <clears throat> if not like Page or something as their valet or manager. I love the British Invasion. In, uh, in TNA a number of years ago, I thought they were a great stable, great tag team. I mean, I'm part English, so I'm biased in that respect. That being said, um, I think that, I think TNA, WWE should do another English-like stable, if not that UK stable that people bring up constantly to this day from WWE uh, 12, I think it was, featuring Wade Barrett, Sheamus, Drew McIntyre, and William Regal. I thought that was a great idea. And then that was for a video game. That wasn't even reality. So that being said, um, that would probably be my stable if I were to if I were to form one um, this day and age with all British talent from WWE and TNA. The second question was, what are your thoughts on Tajiri possibly heading to TNA? Do you think he can find success in TNA after his run in Japan before he possible jump into TNA? So I haven't seen much of Tajiri's work. I mean, he wasn't a fan at the time that he was in the WWE, but um, from what I've seen, he's a great talent. Very much excited to see him in TNA. TNA's been bringing in a lot of past stars. Tajiri isn't a past star because, to my knowledge, he's never been in TNA. They've been bringing in Loki, Matt Hardy, um, a number of X Division guys, which is great to see. So I'm re very much excited for that. Rhino. So I look forward to seeing Tajiri in TNA. What he'll possibly be doing, I have no idea. He could be involved in the Great Muda um, Sonata stuff. That could be really interesting. Maybe he'll go after the X Division Championship. Whatever you do with Tajiri, it's a good signing for TNA. I don't see him. I, I took this announcement as it's a one time thing. For the New York tapings, I never saw it as one of those things where he'll be around for good, where we actually signed the contract con contract with TNA. I see it as one of those things where he's around for the time being, um, while they're in New York, going into Bound for Glory, especially going into Bound for Glory in Japan, which is huge for TNA. So good for them. But um, yeah, that being said, though, I think that Jerry could find success in TNA. Great to see him back on. Uh, Nation, national television in TNA, hopefully, I mean, or at least for now, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but um, yeah, I think it's a very good signing for TNA, I don't think he's signed with TNA, I mean, I correct myself there, but um, it will be a fun appearance by Tajiri at the New York tapings, they're going to be held at the Man Manhattan Center in the first week of August once again, so um, I'm hopefully going to get tickets to at least one of those shows, it's on the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the first week of August, I'm hoping to get a day off from work on one of those days so I can go, because one of my things, one of my things in the bucket list has always been to go to a TNA show, and they might not be around for very longer, unfortunately, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, if they were to ever go down, I'd regret never going to one of their shows. So hopefully, I can go to their show in early August 
at the Manhattan Center in New York. Next question comes from Paul S. His question was, do you see Rusev being buried soon in the mid-card level, and will he soon be forgotten like Kozlov? I personally don't think so. They've been pushing Rusev a lot better and a lot stronger than Kozlov ever was. And I know Kozlov was involved in the WWE Championship picture by year's end, but let's compare the two for a second, okay? And I've been saying the same thing. I mean, we've been talking about this on Russell Rant Radio for months now and how Kozlov is like, I'm sorry, Rusev is the new Kozlov. But let's compare the two after a couple of months. The guy is more over than Kozlov ever was. Kozlov got dead reactions every single week. Rusev has been involved in actual feuds since his debut. I know he's been squashing enhancement talent, but he's been feuding with Big E, been feuding most notably with Jack Swagger, and one of the best feuds in the company right now. And you can have never seen Kozlov being involved in something that great back in 2008. And in terms of in-ring skills, I know Vladimir Kozlov was a very good in-ring Russian wrestler, Sambo, uh, you know, stuff like of that nature, as is Rusev. But Rusev's entertaining. His moveset is more entertaining, in my opinion, than Kozlov's ever was. His matches are more engaging. Granted, they're only about a minute or two long, but like with the super kick, the camel clutch, and stuff like that, I think he has a better moveset than Kozlov ever did. So I think it's so far so good with Rusev. I'm not his biggest fan, but I am a fan of, of how he's being booked as this unbeatable monster. Hopefully they don't, they don't take the Umaga route with him and Ryback and Great Kali, whatever, and building him up to be fed to John Cena. I hopefully, I really, 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 really hope that's not the route they ended up taking. That's not the case with Rusev. I think he has a lot of potential. But um, no, I don't see him being buried soon. I mean, I'm not saying that's completely out of the question. WWE could easily can the gimmick, can the Russia bullshit, break Lana off on her own, and have Rusev just die off in the mid card before he fades off into obscurity and irrelevancy. But um, I don't see that being the case because I think officials are high enough on Rusev right now that they will push him um, to the best of their ability and push him to that level where he should be at at some point in the upper mid card or wherever. So um, I don't see him being buried soon, but if they do eventually feed him to John Cena, I think it's a big mistake, a wasted opportunity, and hopefully that won't be the case with Rusev, as it was with Kozlov, Kali, Umaga, you name them, being buried by Cena, and you got him. Next question, and the final one from Facebook, my thoughts on Spike canning TNA. So the news broke around midnight last night um, for July 27th, 28th, whatever, whenever I filmed this on Monday, um, late Sunday night, the news broke that there had been a rumor that TNA was not re-signing with Spike TV for their television deal after October. And then confirmation started to set in after TMZ confirmed it or they reported it. TMZ is not the most reliable source. I understand that. But um, with that being said, though, I mean, the conf confirmation broke today. Um, according to one of the Wrestling Dirt Sheets websites, news websites, whatever you want to call them, um, there was confirmation today that TNA officials have confirmed two sources that they have indeed not signed a new TV deal with Spike TV. So I could see this as being a new beginning for TNA or the beginning of the end for TNA for two reasons. One, I've always said for years now, TNA should get the hell off Spike TV. They're a ter terrible network. They have garbage programming. They haven't been promoted for shit on their television show at all. Spike TV does a terrible job of promoting TNA Impact. And TNA Impact is to blame for that, of course. I'm not at all blaming this all on Spike TV. But TNA for years, because for TNA for years, has never even bothered to promote themselves. With all the hotshot people they bring in, like Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, never bothered once to promote their own company that they were that they were working for at the time. But uh, with Spike TV, TNA goes out of their way, out of their goddamn way to promote every other goddamn show on that network, from Bellator to fucking Cops to. Whatever show follows Impact, and they do shit. They don't do shit to promote TNA on their channel. TNA goes out of their way to promote everything for them, but they do nothing for them in return. So I think it's ridiculous, and I think it's only a matter of time. I think it's. I, I, I thought it was only a matter of time before they left Spike. So I'm ecstatic about that, but the problem is, is that if they don't find a new TV deal by the, the end of the year, they're off national TV here in the U.S., which would suck for TNA. And where that, where that deems the future for TNA is beyond me. I'm not going to say that because they didn't score a new TV deal. It's the end of TNA. Anything can happen. Tomorrow they can announce they sign with fucking Telemundo, Disney Channel. It doesn't matter. Um, and that being said, all the jokes that were being made on Twitter last night regarding TNA being canned by Spike were hilarious and by far the most entertaining my timeline has been in a very long time. 
But that being said, though, I'm not going to say it's the end of TNA. They can sign a new contract with another television, uh, with another company, or with another television network. I think that could be great. I'm not at all going to suggest that they're going out of business immediately. Wait until to see what happens. Wait another few more months and see what happens with TNA. And if they don't sign a new deal, then you can start up the rumors that they're going out of business. You can say whatever you want. Um, I really, really hope I'm pulling for TNA and for them to sign a new contract with a new television network. I mean, I may be critical of TNA at times, and rightfully so, because they're not always the best that they should be, and they're pulling up shitty storylines and doing a lot of dumb decisions, I'll say that much. But it's competition. We need variety in wrestling. I know there's Ring of Honor. I know there's the Indies. I know there's going to be Global Force Wrestling, Federation, whatever the fuck it's going to be called by Jeff Jarrett. But it's not enough. None of those things, I mean, G, uh, GWF might be on Spike TV. Uh, not Spike TV, I'm sorry. They might be, I don't know. But they might be on national TV, according to from what I've heard. But even then, I don't know how that's going to pan out either. We need more variety. There are some people that only watch DNA and not WWE. That's the way some people are. I watch both. I'm a wrestling fan. I enjoy both. There are some people in TNA that I very much like to watch, like a Bobby Roode, like a James Storm, like an Austin Aries. They have a lot of great talent. So two things. One, I don't want to see anyone say that WWE is going to buy out TNA. That is the farthest thing from happening. And if it happens, you can shove it in my face. You can say, I told you so. I just don't see that happening for one reason only. And the, and the only reason I could see it happening in some, some bizonko universe, some um, bizarro world universe where WWE buys out TNA, the only reason that would happen is because Vince McMahon wants the video library of TNA for the WWE Network. But why would Vince McMahon give two shits about the TNA video library? They've been around for 10 years which is not long at all compared to WWE's 50 or whatever else. And they just don't have much that great content where I would waste my money on purchasing TNA in their video library. They're not going to take any of their talent. That's, let's, let's say that right now. WWE, if they were to buy out TNA in some bizarro world, they would not take a Bobby Roode. They wouldn't take a James Storm. They wouldn't take an EC3 back, who they fired to begin with. They wouldn't take any of those guys. They wouldn't do an invasion storyline. WCW was at least a close second to WWE for a very long time, and that's why it was considered a big deal when they were bought out by WWEF at the time in 2001. TNA is, I know it's the second biggest wrestling promotion in the U.S., but with WWE here and TNA here, like down here, I'm going to go off the screen here because it's not even close. And I'm not just saying that as a WWE diehard fan. It's the truth. TNA isn't even close to WWE in terms of finance and um, people knowing the, like product awareness and you know simple bullshit like that, that there is no possible chance that teen, that WWE would want anyone from WW or from TNA, excuse me, except for maybe like a Jeff Hardy for a part time thing or a Kurt Angle, a thing they already have. All the young talent they already have enough young talent. They've got the main roster. There's enough guys they're not doing enough with right now. Why would they need more talent that they're not going to do anything with? Do you really want to see Bobby Roode being jobbed out on WWE Superstars every week? It'd be a joke. They already have enough people on the main roster, on the NXT program, in developmental, being trained up right now, in the performance center. They don't need any more talent right now, except for the occasional signing. They can't buy out an entire company and then bring in all these guys and do nothing with them and get fired six months later just because they can. It'd be a waste. So that being said, I don't want to see people say that WWE is going to buy out TNA and like I said, I don't want to see them go out of business because it's variety. I don't want to see anyone out of a job. Like I said before, I've been harsh on TNA in the past. A lot of people have. They've been known to be to be crapped on by a lot of fans, and rightfully so for many, many for many good reasons. But for that being said, though, I, I just want to see them get better. I just want to see them improve. I want to see wrestling in a better state. Like I complain with WWE sometimes. It's not because I hate the product and I'm going to – threaten to stop watching, it's because I want to see WWE get better. I want to see wrestling improve. I want to see change. Much like CM Punk, um, CM Punk hat reference here, I want to see change in WWE TNA, the world of wrestling as a whole. And we can't, we can't see that happen with TNA going out of business. So I really hope they don't go out of business. I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying they won't. We'll have to wait and see what happens with their TV deal. But best case scenario, they sign a new TV deal with another network that knows how to promote them properly. They got a big enough audience with one million, one million people weekly that a network could be interested in signing them to a deal. So hopefully that happens within the next two months or what happens with TNA, I have no idea. But best of luck to TNA. Here's hoping they can sign a new TV deal, if only because I want to see them survive 
and continue to battle through this so I could see guys like James Storm and Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, all that other great talent on my TV every week. Up next, the Twitter questions at Cody Collier 12. His question was, what WrestleMania matches would you like to see on future episodes of WrestleMania Rewind on the WWE Network? Unfortunately, I mean, this might come as a big surprise for some people. Um, I don't watch WrestleMania Rewind on the WWE Network. It's not because I don't want to. I just simply don't have the time. I watch Countdown. I watch some of the old pay-per-views that I review here on the channel, obviously. I watch, uh, I watch NXT. I watch Superstars. It's only 30 minutes long, not even most times. So that's why I watch that. But I just don't have time to watch WrestleMania Rewind or the Beyond the Rings or Legends of Wrestling, which I know all of those things are great. I just unfortunately do not have the time. I know I'm in summer. I'm on summer vacation. I'm working more now than I was during the school year. So maybe when I go back to school in a couple months, I'll be able to check it out. But I did do some research on what episodes have been done for WWE's, the WWE Network's WrestleMania Rewind. So if one of these one of these matches has already been analyzed on the show, I apologize. I should have known better. But these are some matches that I would like to see analyzed on the show. Even though I don't watch it, but I would like I would watch it just to see these matches talked about. But um, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, WrestleMania 10, um, classic brother versus brother matchup. I would love to see that. Or even a Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy. I didn't write that down, but that would be a great matchup to analyze from WrestleMania 25. Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. I think that should absolutely be on there from WrestleMania 21. I know Angle currently isn't in the company. So they can't get thoughts from him on his match and whatever. But maybe when he does sign at some point down the line or in a couple months even, um, that'd be great for WWE to do that. So, yeah, definitely Kurt Angle, HBK, one of the best wrestling matches I've ever seen in WrestleMania. Triple H Batista, I thought it had a great story behind it. Some people called the match flat. I thought it was a really good match with a lot of great story behind it. So good stuff there. Would love to see that analyzed. And now going to the most recent matches or more recent matches. CM Punk and Jericho. Um, I think that could be a great match to analyze from WrestleMania 28. Yeah, as well as the Triple H and Undertaker series. I know they analyzed Shawn Michaels and Undertaker from 25 and 26. Why not go into Triple H Undertaker, not only from 27 to 28, but even acknowledge the WrestleMania 17 matchup, which they never acknowledged on WWE TV in the entire build to either of the matches in recent years of WrestleMania, but it would be great to kind of tap into a little bit. So those are the matches that I would love to see on WrestleMania Rewind on the WWE Network. Next question comes from at Ambrose311. This question was, thoughts on Daniel Bryan's book announcement? Um, I think it's great. I think it's really, really cool to see a book on Daniel Bryan being done. Much like with the documentary, it's not like his career is ending, or at least I hope not in the next surgery. I don't think it will, but I'm not saying – I'm not hoping that it will. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I'm not saying that it will, but I would love to see him back in action. Here's hoping that he will, and I, I know he will be back for a fact. Not for a fact, but – okay, fuck it, move on. <laughs> I don't want to contradict myself more than I already have. That being said, though, my thoughts on Daniel Bryan's book announcement – uh, much like the documentary that they did on Brian right after WrestleMania, his career, it's not over yet. Okay, there's still a lot more to analyze on Daniel Bryan. His career could be going on for the next 10 years. I don't think it will, but it very well could at the rate that Daniel Bryan goes and his longevity and the fact that he really hasn't gotten injured much aside from this neck surgery, which is a major one at that. But And who knows how long he will be out, he'll be around after this. All this, all this goes down. But um, that being said, I think it's better with the books. I'm a big wrestling fan reader in terms of autobiographies. I've read Batista's. I read uh, Rey Mysterio's. Who else? Ted DiBiase's. Both of Jericho's. Goldust. I read a lot of wrestling books. So um, the Rise and Fall of WCW, ECW, same thing. So I'm very anxious to read it, and I would definitely, I, I definitely will read it, and hopefully I do tap into his indie stuff, the ROH stuff. I can guarantee you that that they will, but hopefully they don't gloss over some stuff much like they did with the documentary. They talked about WrestleMania 27 for like 10 seconds and then 28, 29, and everything else that happened in between was completely glossed over. So here's hoping that they do touch upon all the stuff in his WWE tenure from over the last four years, as well as go into um, what's happening right now with the neck surgery and stuff like that. But like I said before, there's still a lot love to be done with Daniel Bryan in WWE. So I'm a bigger fan of waiting until they're retired to write a book. Like with Edge's book, I heard it was really good. But I'm also, I also just kind of don't really want to read it because I think it was published shortly after he won the WWE title the first time or maybe even beforehand. There was so much that was done with Edge six years after that until he re officially retired. So there's so much left. There, there was so much more to be done in the, in the career of Edge that he didn't write about in that book. And I think he's writing a follow-up or a sequel 
but I, I really want to read it all. I just don't want to read half of it or, you know, the second half of his career. I want to read it all at once. And maybe sometimes it's not all that possible. Like with Jericho, I understand that. Like he does, uh, you know, his first run with WWE, then the second run. That's a little bit better. But with Edge, he was with the company for how many years straight? And they split it up into two different books. And I thought it should be all in one, in my personal opinion, anyway. But even so, I'm looking forward to it. should be great. Um, I'm very much looking forward to what they include, and I look forward to reading it as well. At the Average Grunt, two questions from his. The first one was, have you ever played WWE All-Stars? Did you like it? And if so, what features would you add for a sequel? If not, why not? Absolutely! I love WWE All-Stars. I might be in the minority here. When I first saw the commercials on Phoebe, I'm like, wow, that looks like absolute shit. Because it looks like the most illogical thing ever. And funny story here, um, I get to college um, last September, first freshman year of college, and um, I, I, you know, my friends know. I mean, I don't really go out and tell them. I don't really flat out and say it. But um, some of my roommates, you know, find out that I'm a wrestling fan and stuff like that. A kid who lives down the hall, he's like, "Oh, you're a wrestling fan? I own this game on for my Xbox, WWE All Stars." He's like, "Oh, I own this crappy video game." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, yeah, it is pretty crappy." You know, All Stars isn't the greatest thing ever, but um, it does have like crappy that uh. You know, like that unrealistic feel to it. And that's what makes it fun. But he's like, you know, we, I have this dumb, fun video game, this wrestling video game that I bought for only five bucks. And I bought it because I could. You know, we can probably play it sometime. And we played it for like months after that. We got a hook down the game. I unlocked every character in the game. I played it. I probably played that a lot more than any other game when I did in college. Aside from SmackDown vs. Raw, General Manager Mode 2007. That's the only other game that I can recall playing more than All-Stars. During my freshman year of college, aside from maybe Mario Kart or Super Smash Bros. Brawl, but All Stars is just so much fun. It's dumb fun. It's not. It's not a game that I can recommend um, playing if you're very serious about your wrestling. Like, go play the WWE 2K14-15 video games. This is for the fans that just like to have fun, and this game provides that for you. The move sets aren't elaborated. They're not a lot of in-depth stuff. The entrances even go on like for two seconds. You see them come out on stage, and that's it. There's not a lot of depth to the video game, but it's just so much fun to play with friends and stuff like that. But yeah, I love it. And your second question, or the second part of it, your first question was, um, what features would I add for a sequel? I don't know if they should do a sequel. I mean, I don't really know how they could go about doing a sequel. Maybe they could with more with more recent talent. And uh, But the Legends would be the same. I mean, I know Warrior was in that game, one of the first WWE video games he had been in in years. Uh, Macho Man, Randy Savage... Jake the Snake, Hulk Hogan, The Rock, Stone Cold. I mean, the talent in that game from, like, the modern era, like, <laughs> Drew McIntyre was in that game, Kofi Kingston. Maybe they could remake it with guys like Bray Wyatt. And I, you know what the best part of that video game that I love the most? Not only the gameplay was dumb fun, but the fucking video package. The video packages that they did for that game, the freaking video packages that they did for the Fantasy Warfare matchups were amazing. Like, WWE's production team is, like, Five, uh, top notch, five star stuff. That goes without saying. So it really, I think this uh, it comes as no surprise that any video package that they do are great, and this is no exception. Um, play the game if only for the fantasy warfare, like with the Punk and Stone Cold matches, and uh, Cena versus Hogan, and Rock versus whoever they had, or Cena and Rock and Hogan and whoever Hogan faced. I don't know what the fuck it was, but I don't know. There's a lot of fantasy warfare matches on that game, and the roommate of mine that wanted to play this game that we played so much that I played so much with in this video game, he wanted to play the game if only to watch the video packages, not even for the gameplay. I mean, we played for the gameplay too, but he loved the game so much just for the video packages because they were just so much fun and so well put together. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a great game. I really enjoyed it. What features should they add for a sequel? I don't know if you could pull off a sequel. I think it's one of those nice one-and-done-like things with, like, Legends of WrestleMania, which I haven't played in years. I never really played that. My brother did, and we had that for the Xbox. But um, I think All-Stars is a very fun game. I don't think a sequel should be done because I thought the first one was very fun, and you can't really repeat that except for maybe adding some more modern stars aside from, you know, Drew McIntyre and Kingston. Maybe you replace them with Bray Wyatt or a S.H.I.E.L.D. member maybe even. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great game. Go play it. Go out of your way to watch it or to play it, I'm sorry, just to watch the video packages and in, in Fantasy Warfare. I think they're excellent. But um, next question, his, his next question is, uh, it's not really even a question. He said, 
true or false, 2012 was the best year of CM Punk's career. Absolutely. People will say 2011, that's my most memorable year as a wrestling fan, even though it was not the best year for the WWE or wrestling as a whole for that matter. But with that being said, though, 2012, he was WWE champion all year. He was in a featured match at WrestleMania 27, not really. He wasn't the main event at WrestleMania 28, but he was the second to last matchup with Jericho for the WWE Championship. Like I said, held the title all year long, had a lot of great title defenses, was the focal point of Raw for the latter half of the year, ended Raw 1000 with his epic heel turn, paired with Paul Heyman, did a lot of great stuff there, had a great series of matches with John Cena, Daniel Bryan, Kane even, Ryback. Definitely 2012 was the best year of CM Punk's career. Um, 2011, I know some people say that year, like I just said before, the only real rise that CM Punk had in 2011 was that summer of Punk. That was better than the summer of 2012, in my opinion. But the early part of the year, he did nothing. The guy was the job guy on Raw. He did a feud with John Cena, but it really wasn't anything noteworthy. He lost his feud to Randy Orton. And after the summer of Punk ended, he lost to Triple H. He lost to Awesome Truth. He lost to Del Rio a few times. So, And I know he won back the championship by year's end, but it was too little too late. The year overall for 2011 for CM Punk... It was not the year of CM Punk. 2012, I thought, was definitely his year. It was a better year for Punk overall than 2011 was. But my personal opinion, though. Next question comes from... At Hardy VX Fan. If you could repackage any current WWE superstar or diva in the WWE, who would it be and what would you repackage them to be? I didn't prepare for this question. I probably should have. Um, but uh, let's think here off the top of my head. Who could they repackage? Like a Michael McGillicuddy was definitely one of them, but they've already done so about a year ago. Not successfully, but they repackaged him as Curtis Axel. Um, Xavier Woods, I think, could have been a perfect candidate for this question. I mean, they've already kind of repackaged him as the mouthpiece for this new stable that they're doing with uh, Kofi Kingston and Big E. So I would probably say Xavier Woods. Maybe even an Alex Riley, who I would love to see on the wrestling roster again aside from being on the pre-show panels and stuff like that. Put him back in the frickin' roster. I thought the guy was over. He's decent enough in the ring where he can carry a good matchup. So maybe an Alex Riley. Um, I'm trying to think like a Drew McIntyre, but he, he's gone now. I'm trying to think. Heath Slater, I think, would be perfect for a repackaging right now with 3MB gone. Make him the one-man rock band again. 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 Ditch the 3MB theme song. Have him go out on his own again. Do some stuff like that. Don't turn him baby face, but make him as entertaining as he was um, during 2011 when he was on his own, or definitely during when the when he did that Legends storyline leading into Raw 1000. I thought that was the best work of his career. And even though he was losing in 30 second matches, not even he was, his mic skills were great. The guy was over. He was getting a reaction. So yeah, I would love to see Heath Slater repackaged um, of all the people on the roster. There's probably more people, but definitely him. Ryback too. Bring him back to the baby face persona. Um, Divas. Paige just recently turned heel. Emma, maybe. I mean, the whole dancing thing, I love it. It was over in NXT, but it hasn't gone anywhere on the main roster. Maybe you repackage her. And no, don't do a, a theft gimmick with Emma. Don't do anything dumb like that. I thought that was stupid. Some people just joke about that, which is okay, but don't seriously do that. I'm glad WWE didn't. But, um, yeah, those are some people that I would repackage, superstar-wise and diva-wise. Next question comes from at the N Innovator. We got like five or six questions off. I'm already 53 minutes into this thing. Holy shit. I'll try to speed this up. I'm sorry. Um, if you could make a brand new match type, what would it be called and what would be the rules? Um, I'm not even going to try to answer this question because I would come off as so Vince Russo like for making something like a. Some of the recent match ideas that TNA comes up with are just asinine and. I just really can't come up with much. I mean, I'm not that original, that innovative as a person, that original where I can come up with an all-new match type. And it's funny that you mentioned this, because me and my friend John, at Heal by Design on Twitter, were talking about this a few days ago. If WWE came up to you, offering you a job on their creative team, and they asked you for an idea, a match idea, that could become the next Money in the Bank, that could become the next Royal Rumble, that could become the next big thing, what would it be? And I can't think of anything. I mean, it's out there. It's going to be made one day. I just personally can't think of anything. But kind of on that topic, kind of branching off a little bit, one match idea that I really did like that should have been done more with was the scramble match. I thought that was a great match concept. It wasn't – okay, it wasn't great, but it was really good. 
and I thought it was enjoyable. And they scrapped it after 2009, after they did it that, at that Unforgiven pay-per-view a few years ago in 28 and 2008. They did it one more time at the Bash 09, and that was it. And I thought that was a really cool match set that they could have done more with um, you know, in, in the years that followed. Maybe it will make a, re, uh, make a return at some point. But, yeah, I thought that was a great match idea that they could have done more with, but they never did. At Green Day Bunny Axe, her question was, what were your thoughts on Paige's heel turn? I thought it was great. I thought uh, she wasn't really getting over all that much as a baby face. She wasn't getting no reaction, but she will probably – fit into her role better as a heel on the main roster, especially if she goes the anti-diva route. Um, the way that it was all executed, I thought was great. I mean, you saw it coming. It was predictable. But predictability, as I would say, is not always a bad thing. The way this all went down was great. The crowd popped for the uh, heel turn. The attack was vicious. AJ sold like a beast, like a champ, literally and figuratively. So um, the, the, the idea of this feud it's great. I love the premise behind it. Paige turning on AJ, setting up their rematch for SummerSlam for the Diva Championship. Like I said, it's absolutely fantastic. I thought the heel turn was great. And I'm looking forward to where this feud goes from here. At AJ Styles 5150, the question was, do you watch any indie wrestling? And if you do, what promotions do you watch? And what wrestlers do you like from the indies? I don't watch. I've said this before. I don't watch like the CZW or... New Japan Pro Wrestling or any of the indie the or any of the indie promotions or anything like that, simply because I don't really have the time, not really or really the interest to be quite honest with you. I mean, I really started watching Ring of Honor only a couple of months ago, and I enjoy that. So if you don't watch Ring of Honor, definitely give it a, definitely check it out. Um, but people, indie wrestlers that I would that I like from the indies, um, or another promotion I go to, I don't really watch it. Northeast Wrestling, it's not really anything that you can watch online. They do local shows here in the area, here in the Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts area. They bring in top stars. They're having a show this Saturday with Bret Hart, um, the, uh, the, the Hardys versus the Young Bucks. It's going to be a big show. It's like their version of WrestleMania. It's called Wrestling Under the Stars. They're a promotion that I suggest that you check out if you're in the Northeast area. Um, New England Championship Wrestling I got into when I started college last year. They taped their shows at a community center down the down the uh, road from where my college is so I go to their shows every month they hold it one show a month and the tickets are only like 10 15 bucks and you can find them on YouTube if you type in New England Championship Wrestling or NECW TV or anything like that um, so check definitely check them out superstars from the indies that I like Antonio Thomas from NECW I think he's great he was uh, one of the, one half of the heartthrobs in WWE so I think that he's a very Good talent that could be signed by either WWE or TNA. They wouldn't do anything with him. I think they would completely mishandle him. But he's a great talent. Um, who else? Matt Taven. I've been a big fan of since day one, since I attended my very first indie event back in 2009. Matt Taven, he's on uh, ROH TV right now, but he's a great talent. I would love to see him in TNA or WWE. Uh, Kevin Steen has also caught my eye when I've been starting to watch uh, ROH as well. He might be on his, well on his way to be uh, WWE bound. As well as Adam Cole, I think his work as a heel and ROH for the last few months has been great. So really much enjoy him as well. Next question comes from at Ayo Yo Dio. His question was, why do you think there's a lack of top African-American WWE superstars? All of them are basically mid-carders or jobbers. I answered this question last week as well. I can't tell you. But um, like I said, I answered this, I think, the first or second question in last week's video. So for my full thoughts on it, go back and check that out. I don't think it's a racism thing. I don't think Vince McMahon is racist. I know some former talents have said that. I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, I haven't worked for the company, so I wouldn't know. I just think it's a, I, I just think it's a fact of the matter that uh, it, it's a matter of WWE not having for anything for them to do. It's not a fact that oh they're black, so we're not going to do anything with them. No, I don't think that at all. I think it's just uh, the matter of these guys being extremely talented and just not being used. I think it's a, a definitely a coincidence that. All of the black wrestlers in WWE aren't doing anything. Titus O'Neil, Kofi, Big E, Xavier Woods, R-Truth, none of them are doing anything of note. And um, I don't think it's intentionally to hold them down. I just think it's a fact that they're just not doing anything with them. And it's not just them. It's Damian Sandow, Dolph Ziggler. So they're not the only ones, but I definitely see where you're coming from. But on that note, since last week's video, um, it's funny because I answered this question last week and then only a few hours later on Raw did they form a new reformed version of the Nation of Domination with Xavier Woods, Kofi, and Big E. Hopefully they add Truth in there as a heel or even Titus O'Neil. So I think that'd be great. So hopefully they do do that at some point with um, adding in all these other guys. So 
if they don't have a lack of if they have a lack of top African American WWE superstars right now, and they do, hopefully that changes with this new stable with Woods, Kofi, and Biggie involved. Can I see any of those guys as world champion? Probably not. But they don't have to be world champion. They just need to be booked better in the upper mid card or mid card at the very least. They don't have them jobbing out to roost every week. It doesn't make any sense. So hopefully this new date, Nation of Domination stable does go somewhere. My full thoughts on that can be found in the latest Wrestle Rant Radio from last week for uh, July 22nd, 2014. And the clip is also here on the channel, so you can check that out after you're done watching this. we got two more questions left at Team CM Punk PMA. His question was, who's your favorite wrestler and why? It was CM Punk until his contract expired. He's no longer in the company. So I will have to go with currently. I mean, I said this on my Facebook page last week, but it's going to have to be Dean Ambrose. Big fan of The Miz, Chris Jericho, um, Zack Ryder, uh, who else in my top five? William Regal, of course. He's not my current favorite active wrestler because he's semi-retired. But, um, yeah, I guess I'd have to go with Dean Ambrose and quickly becoming a fan of his. With CM Punk on, he's probably my new number one with Zack Ryder, Miz, and Chris Jericho closely following. And Jericho not really being an active guy. He's a part-timer, so to speak. But, um, yeah, my favorite active guy right now would have to be Dean Ambrose. Up next to my final question, I apologize for going over an hour this week. <laughs> Definitely the longest video to date. At the Wrestle Guy, his question was, if Undertaker cannot get in the ring with Sting due to injuries, who would be the next best pick? Um, let's see here. I really want to see Undertaker and Sting, but that, that can't happen. I still do want to see Sting wrestle. Um, Triple H was talking about this in his most recent interview, sit down interview with Michael Cole, either last week or the week before, but he teased that a match with between himself and Sting at WrestleMania 31, which they wouldn't be opposed to seeing as long as Sting wins. Sting-John Cena is a match I don't want to see because John Cena would easily win, nor should Sting win, so it's a lose-lose situation. So that shouldn't happen, but Triple H, as long as Sting wins, I see no reason why Triple H should win that matchup, but that could be a good matchup slash, slash program. And also Sting versus Bray Wyatt, two very similar gimmicks, and the promos could be off the charts. One match for Sting, Bray Wyatt goes over. Even if Sting wins, the big rub for Bray Wyatt to even be in the ring with uh, Sting. And it's not going to be a repeat of the John Cena angle where Sting will make a mockery of Bray Wyatt and continue to win the entire feud overall because it's just one match and not a three-part series. So that being said, though, um, two matches that I would love to see Sting in at WrestleMania 31, either with Triple H or Bray Wyatt. So that is going to do it for this week's video, guys. I apologize for going well over an hour this week. But it's all up to you guys. You guys send in the questions. There's a lot of great questions. I hate to gloss over anything. I hate to go quick on anything. It's got a lot of thoughts up in here regarding all of your awesome questions. So as always, thank you guys for sending in the questions on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can do so by either leaving a comment down below, and it will be featured in next week's edition. You can leave a comment on my Facebook page. I usually put up the question on Sunday nights. You can leave a comment on that post. Leave a comment on the wall. doesn't really matter, but either way, Facebook is always an option as well, as well as Twitter. Tweet me on Twitter with the hashtag AskGSM at WrestleRant, and your question will be answered on next week's show. So with all that being said, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys next week.